Utah at Colorado. Colorado is about a 10-point favorite thereabouts. Total set at around 48. 12 o'clock Eastern time on Fox. Colorado is a comfy favorite this week. Again, uh, they're going to be a narrow favorite next week at Kansas, probably inside a three, and they'll be a two-touchdown favorite against Oklahoma State. Colorado is in control of their own destiny to get to the college football playoff. They have just one Big 12 loss right now, and with Kansas State suffering a second loss and Iowa State suffering a second loss, that means Colorado is in full control of their own destiny. If they win out, they'll be in the Big 12 title game, and if they win the Big 12, they'll be in the college football playoff. Number one question in this game, will this be Shador Sanders' Heisman moment? Now, I do think there's a challenging aspect of Shador Sanders' Heisman argument. His support amongst Heisman voter pool might be affected by the amount of support that Travis Hunter is currently receiving as well. It's extremely rare for two players from the same team to both be in the Heisman mix. Now, we have seen it before, but in the modern era, and I define the modern era as the BCS era, which means basically from 1998 until today about 26 years. We've seen multiple Heisman finalists from one team on a few different occasions. In 2020, Alabama did it with Mac Jones and Devontae Smith. In 2016, Baker Mayfield did it with uh, with D.D. Westbrook at Oklahoma. Reggie Bush and Matt Leiner did it twice in 2004 and 2005. And in 2004, you had another set of teammates in there as well with Jason White and Adrian Peterson from Oklahoma. And then finally in 2002, Ken Dorsey and Willis McGahee. So it happens, but it is rare. And you can make a case that this is the best we'll be lining up against. Now, Utah's defensive numbers, you look at some of their efficiency numbers, maybe they're not great. But if you look at some of the pass-specific numbers, voters as to whether or not he should be considered for the award. Question number two, can Colorado protect Shador? If they can, I believe that he can carve you up. He's in the top 10 passing in pretty much every offensive category. Completions, completion percentage, passing yardage, touchdowns, 20 plus yard completions, off target percentage, like all the things that matter, he's in the top 10. Uh, The one issue that you have with Shador this year is that he's taken 28 sacks. Now, some of those can be attributed to the offensive line. Some of those, it's because he holds the ball a little longer than most quarterbacks in the country. But those 28 sacks taken, that's 122nd. So if you look at how their offensive line has played, especially in the last few weeks, man, they're starting to come on. They've improved greatly from where they were a year ago. It's not even close when you watch that offensive line against this year's version of Colorado's group up front. And when you look at Utah, they might not have a whole lot offensively, but they do have a defense that prides themselves on getting after the opposing quarterback. They're top 20 in pressure percentage. It hasn't necessarily led to a bunch of sacks. They have just 16 this year, that's 87th, but they do apply a lot of pressure and they do register a lot of quarterback hits. And in the last couple of weeks, we've seen the aggressiveness for Utah increased dramatically. We've seen more blitzes, we've seen more pressures, we've seen more exotics. That was against Houston and BYU. I would expect that number to continue to increase because this is an offensive line that can be overloaded if you bring extra defenders. So worth watching, can Colorado protect Shador? Question number three, can Utah get anything going offensively? Now the injury report for Utah is a huge problem. Brandon Rose, he's started last week. He's now out. Uh, He's the third quarterback that Utah's lost for the season following Cam Rising and Sam Heward. Uh, Utah was picked to win the Big 12 in the first year of the league. All of us that picked Utah, self-included, I picked them. I thought that the injury woes that they dealt with last year were a thing of the past. Well, it was only the beginning because the injury woes this year have been maybe not quite as consequential, but pretty significant. Uh, They now have lost three quarterbacks. They have lost 
one of their top receivers in Money Parks. They've lost their tight end, Brant Keithy, who just sustained a season-ending injury against BYU. Uh, their freshman quarterback, Isaac Wilson, who was initially the one that replaced Cam Rising as the starter, uh, he's probably going to be in there, and he hasn't been great this year. Just 55% completion for about 1,200 yards, 8-8 to eight touchdown to interception ratio. This offense is going to run exclusively through Makai Bernard. He's their bell cow running back. He's got 860 yards this year. 570 of those yards come after contact. So he's a guy that is really, really powerful and is very difficult to bring to the ground. Now, Colorado, they've been significantly better against the run this year, but they're still not elite. They give up about 150 yards rushing a game. They're in the 70s. Still a significant jump from where they were, but not necessarily a group that's going to completely lock down the line of scrimmage. But if you look at their yards per carry numbers, that's where they actually start to look pretty good. They're under four yards a carry given up. They're in the top 50. And Colorado last week, they almost got a test run with a back similar to Makai Bernard last week. He finished with 31 carries for 137 yards. So not like a huge day, but it starts good. If they can just extend that for four quarters, I'd feel even better about it. They really only have one weapon on the outside, and that's Dory difficult to defend. A couple trends in the game. Colorado, they've covered in seven straight games. It's the longest active streak in the FBS. Utah, they've covered nine straight as an underdog of at least seven points. That's the longest active streak in the FBS. So a couple streaks that are going at it here this weekend. I just don't think Utah has enough weapons to be able to create enough offense against a defense that is improved. I don't think they're going to be able to manufacture much through the air, so their only path to success is by running the ball over and over and over again. I think Utah will hang. I think they'll shrink the game, but ultimately it won't be enough. I like Colorado, but I would take the points here because I think Utah will grind this game to a halt and make it difficult and shrink the amount of possessions that Shador Sanders and company will get. Giant killers, we give you these every single week. I'm going to start with a little action on Friday night. Houston is at Arizona. Take Houston. Feel good about this one. Houston's been trending up. Arizona's been trending down. Arizona can't get a whole lot right right now. I think Houston goes in there and carries some momentum and gets a win. I like Michigan State against Illinois. Michigan State has slowly but surely been rounding into form as well as long as they don't turn it over. So Sparty against the Illini. I like Sparty to get the job done there. I told you about these two. I like Kansas over BYU. And I like Florida over LSU. Like we always ask you, please like, rate, and subscribe to the show. We appreciate all the support that you've shown us here at Always College Football, and we look forward to more support from you guys here in the future. We'll be back on Sunday with some rapid fire takeaways, and we'll be back on Monday with the 10 things we learned to help set up the home stretch here of the college football season. So for all of us here at ACF, for Mark, Jake, Jack, the 